you maybe not, you won't tell me, but what kind of visibility are you going to have in the back half of the year in terms of deals, deploying capital, uh, and the kind of returns you can expect? Yeah, well, Alex, first, thanks a lot for having me on today. Um, and um, uh, as you mentioned, we, we announced our intra-quarter monetization today is a record number for us. Just to put that into a little bit of context, uh, last year we generated about $2 per share of earnings. And what we've told our investors is to expect over the next few years that we could more than double our earnings to 4 to $5 per share. And we think we're going to get there really in two ways. Uh, the first way uh, is by increasing our fee-related earnings, and that's principally going to happen through our fundraising activities. The second way that we think we can drive earnings is through monetizing our existing investment portfolio, and that's really what our announcement today was about. And our $900 plus million dollars of revenue is more than 100% of the average of prior quarters. So really gives you a sense of our conviction and our ability to, to really be able to scale our earnings over the next number of years. Rob, good morning. It's Guy. Thanks for the time. Um, you've got a Thank lot God. of money, therefore, that you're going to be deploying. How can you... How can you be so convinced that you're going to be able to deploy that money effectively into deals that are going to turn out to be good? How convinced are you that your visibility over that term that you're talking about is going to be spot on? Yeah, it's a it's totally fair question, Guy. So if you look back over the last 12 months, our capital deployment is actually up 70 percent uh, relative to the prior period. And to be fair, a lot of that happened. Most of that capital was committed in the first half of 2020 when the markets were really dislocated. So we feel really good about that capital that we've put to work. In terms of go forward capital deployment, it is obviously a challenging environment, uh, but we think we've got a few competitive advantages here at KKR. Number one, we're a global organization. Uh, we've got deep industry expertise, asset class expertise, and we're a connected organization. Uh, we incent people to work together, and that's a big competitive advantage here. Number two, uh, we're highly thematic in our approach. And what that does for us is when we find a theme we like, we can be really aggressive in pursuing it. And then lastly, uh, we've spent decades here at KKR building up capabilities that we think make the businesses we invest in better. Uh, and by virtue of having all three of those uh, competitive advantage, we think we're going to be able to find, continue to find opportunities that generate really good returns for our investors for the risk that we're taking. So broad stroke on that, how quickly can you deploy capital right now? Our teams are really active uh, across the globe and across different asset classes. And so um, there's a fair bit of activity. And as I mentioned, our capital deployment is, is up substantially on a year-over-year -year basis. So uh, our teams are, are seeing a lot of deal flow in the market today across a lot of what we do, Alex. OK, let's, let's talk about that deal flow. Let's get a little bit more granular. You talk about it being global. Um, are you looking to deploy more money outside of the United States? Uh, I know you've got a history in Asia. What does the picture look like there? I'm seeing a lot of deal flow happening in Europe, particularly in the UK recently. What does the picture look like there? Break it down for me. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, so uh, we are absolutely uh, spending a ton of time uh, internationally from a deployment perspective, and we can go market by market. Uh, in Asia, as you noted, uh, our Asia business, a big part of KKR. We've got $30 billion of AUM uh, dedicated to the region. That's up almost 100% year over year. Wow. Uh, we're seeing lots of opportunity to deploy capital in Asia. Of course, there's an overriding theme uh, of the rising middle class in a, in a number of the uh, more growth-oriented markets. Uh, we're trying to break that down into subsectors. So a big subsector to take advantage of that theme that we've been deploying capital against is healthcare in Asia. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time in corporate carve-outs across northern Asia and markets like Japan and Korea. And then in, in Europe as well, a big theme for us across the region uh, is around telecom, both in our private equity as well as our infrastructure business. A couple of transactions that we've been able to get done are fiber copa, fiber of the home business in Italy, and uh, Open Dutch is a broadband platform in the Netherlands that we recently backed. Oh, interesting. Um the market in general is doing much more value, say, in Europe than in U.S. Like, are you still do, um, as active as deploying capital in the U.S. as you might have been, say, a year ago? Well, at this stage a year ago, when the, when the markets were really dislocated, we were, we were very active from a deployment perspective. But I would say it was a different kind of deployment. Uh, and that was probably more middle, down in the middle of the fairway in the thematic approach that we've been taking. We see a lot of things that were mispriced in the market. And we're really happy that we pursued those investments because we think they're going to inure to the benefit of our shareholders for a long period of time. You know, the stuff we're seeing in the U.S. today, I would say, you know, we got to be more creative. We got to be more thoughtful about putting capital work, but we continue to see opportunities that take advantage of, of the broader investment platform that we have across the firm today.
you're going to need your people to be completely on point. Um, you're going to yeah. need people back in the office. You're going to need people travelling. Um, how's it going to work for you? How is, how is the transition sort of back from working from home going? Um, a, a lot of financials I know in New York are talking about requiring vaccinations. Is that something you're going to be asking for as well? Can you just kind of walk me through what your process lo processes look like? Yeah, for sure. And so in the U.S. today, we're probably about 50 to 60 percent capacity. And that's been going up every week over the last few months. In parts of Asia, it's probably similar. Europe, you know, as you know, is probably a little bit further behind. But our expectation here as we get into the middle of July is that most of our people, at least in the U.S., are going to be back to work. And we're excited about that. As I mentioned, you know, we thrive on having a collaborative and connected culture here. Mm -hmm. And so getting everyone back to the office is really important for us. Um, last question, Rob. You can't avoid it. You're the CFO of KKR, and that's on carried interest. So it feels like the attack on carried interest from D.C. is just continuing. Uh, what happens if that changes? Slash, are you anticipating a higher corporate tax for you guys also? Yeah, no, uh, uh, it's a totally fair question. As I, it won't surprise you, we're focused here on, on the things that we can control in the legislative process out of Washington. Uh, is not one of them. Uh, but I'd say around uh, carried interest corporate taxation, KKR is a corporate tax uh, payer regardless of of the income that we receive. And so my focus on KKR's P&L, to the extent that corporate tax rates increase, you know, KKR's uh, tax are going to increase alongside all of corporate America. And so that's really, you know, that's really what my focus on is, is on our own P&L.